All right, so you guys have all taken the student course evaluation, hopefully, and then there's that. And there. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about the final project. Uh, I sent out an announcement. I, I was, it was pointed out to me by a student that the, one of the dates was wrong for the notebook submission. It is, in fact, December 19th, not what I had posted in the Blackboard. Uh, let's see. Any questions generally on that? If you haven't, if you haven't started your notebooks for the project, I'd recommend, you know, thinking about it a little bit. I'll be around between now and December 18th, so I'm happy to meet with you in person. Uh, and then there will be in-class presentations by lottery selection, same as we did for project one. Oh yeah, and then your notebooks are going up on the internet just to, you know, create some sense of accountability. So other people then will then be able to see them, you know, not just me and you. So. All right, so one of the uh, issues that I observed with sort of visualizations in general is that uh, very early in the semester, we talked about like, here's this data visualization catalog, here's all the possible plots that are available, right? No one looks at that and then memorizes all of those. So don't feel bad for not knowing all the plot types. But the sort of general question is, how do I get that mental model of all the possible visualizations into my head, right? And I would argue, one good way is just repeated exposure to a bunch of different visualizations. And then you're like, well, where would I find a bunch of visualizations? And, and more importantly, where would I find a website that shows the same data with different representations? Because that really helps you figure out which of these visualizations is more useful for the same data set. You almost never see that. You typically see like, you know, here's a news article with one infographic, and there's no alternative visualization comparison, right? So what you really want is something that shows uh, different methods of visualizing the same data. Oops. That's, apparently, I need to click on one. There we go. All right, slow to load. So there's this great website that I have linked in the slides. Uh, oh, it's gone. And the slide is it's Makeover Monday. And so basically, the idea behind the website, if, who here is read Makeover Monday? Awesome. All right, so I'm delivering some value already. <laughs> So Makeover Monday is basically the idea of like every week there's a new visualization challenge. And so what this gets you is sort of like, you know, standard 601 project type thing of like, here's some data, tell me what's in it, right? And, and it's kind of cool because everyone attacks it, the same data set, right? But a bunch of different visualizations from different, different people. And what's also cool is like often people who are making products, like visualization products, will use Makeover Monday as sort of like a platform to get word out about their product. So if you're wondering, like, how does Microsoft BI visualize this data? That's actually available, and we'll pull that up in a moment. But basically, lots of different people visualizing the same data set. And you can just see from this, I don't even know, what is this? This is smartphone ownership. And it's just like, I actually don't care what the data is. But there's some story present and available in this data that everyone is telling with these different plots. It's the same data. So this is sort of like one way of... You know, continue, you're not going to be in 601 for the rest of your life, so you need some educational resource, I hope, right? Some resource that allows you to find different options of what different visualizations exist. So I can, I can recommend this website. It's pretty, like, visually appealing, and you just get to see, like, this huge diversity of plots that, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Where else to find this? I don't know, but this is kind of fun to look at. So there was a data set that um, I wanted to look at, um, my friend and I, He's, he's like an Excel R person, and I'm like a Python person. And so the question of like, you know, who can visualize this data faster, more efficiently, and, and more beautifully? And so I won, uh, right, just saying. <clears throat> so, so <laughs> like, I won't spend a lot. This notebook is uh, available, I believe, uh, in Blackboard currently. So I won't spend a bunch of time in it. But basically, uh, you know, I grabbed the CSV from the original data source using request. And then, you know, I sort of preview it, look at the, the lines, that are, and then I have to split. So the original, it just comes in and there's this giant list of, of text, and it has these slash r slash n's. Those are the line breaks in the CSV. Now I know I can split on those line breaks, and I get a list of the lines. And then I basically jam that into a pandas data frame. So I have a list. And one of the, the first 
uh, list of characters is the header, so then I just use that. So this is the CSV. All right. Not so exciting. And then I have to do some manipulations of like the age column isn't obviously the index, so I, I want to move, move that into the index so that the years are along the top. So I do that. Now I've got a data frame that I'm pretty happy with. I look at the bottom of that data frame just for consistency, and I see that there was, for whatever reason, a row of all nuns. So I'm just going to drop that whole row. It's empty. All right. So I've got the age on the left-hand side. So this is the, the age and years of the people who have died. And then you can look at that. I've got a clean data set. And then this is basically, I, I'll show you the visualization first and then what I did to get it. All right. So this is the age at which the person died and the year. Right? And it, there's, a, there's a very clear story here, right? The more close we go in time, the older the people are getting that are dying. So that's that's like a very easy story to pick out, right? That that you probably would not have picked out from the CSV. So then the other sort of like trickery that I had to play down here was there are as many ticks on this plot as there are year, uh, ages, and so I wanted to only show every I think like fifth one, one, two, three, four, five. yeah. So I wanted to show every fifth tick and every other year to make this a little sparser. So then I didn't have a bunch of overlapping labels. So that's this part right here. So I just wanted to hide every, yeah, ticks one through four I get hidden, and every fifth one I save. And then same thing down here, I'm just hiding every other tick. Set, P, set property, yeah, and then so this is so there's a plot, and there are properties of the plot, and then in that plot, I want to get the current axis, so the axis is either the horizontal or vertical axis, and I can set the the tick labels there, and I can set properties on those. Basically, I'm turning them invisible. You know, visible equals false. So ticks, so the <laughs> list operations you can do like one. Three, five, right? So like odd numbers. It's basically what this is doing. So this is like every other number starting from one. So, anyways, that's just a little sort of quick notebook. So, you know, how to get little challenges like this? Seek out challenges where there are other people competing with you, and this is a good example. So this is like Kaggle, but for visualization and no actual competition. So, okay. I'll get rid of, that's not this one. Oh yeah, so th this is this is what I liked. So like, uh, this is the MicrosoftBI.com website. So they're showing off what their product can do. And you and <laughs> this is to me amusing, right? So like, this is their fancy product that you spend lots of money on, and you get this, and it's a great infographic, right? It looks very visually appealing. But the story there is not as clear as that surface plot that I was using. I would argue, that's my bias, right? So like. This to me is the same data is being represented, but to me not as clearly. Okay, that's yeah. all right. All right, yeah. So this is the last class, basically. So I'm gonna make a little advertisement. Basically, this is my advertisement that Data 601 is better than machine learning. I'll tell you why. <laughs> not fast. All right. So basically, the focus is that you will, <laughs> as a data scientist, the most strong association that non, you know, technical people will have is that data scientist does machine learning, and that's cool. But in my experience, most of the data scientist time is not spent on machine learning. Right? You may advertise yourself as that person, but most of your time will not be spent doing that. So I'm going to tell you why 601 will be with with you for the rest of your career as a data scientist. All right, so I focused on all the things that you know were not machine learning, and hopefully you got some value out of those. So cleaning data, data characterization, those are like the bulk of your work. But then there's all this other stuff going on that gets a lot of hype. This is what gets the attention, and and it's well deserved. I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing, but uh, and there's a lot of complexity here. So like people are often attracted to sort of the mathematics and the programming complexity and the computational cost. And there's a lot of focus on this. That's, it's, it's useful, so don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it deserves a spot. But uh, 
all of that is only enabled once you've done all the work from this class. So you have to clean the data, right? You have to find the data. You have to talk to the people. You have to understand which customer am I trying to help and in what way, on what timeline, for what purpose, and what will they gain from the work, right? So, all right. So I haven't talked uh, anything about feature engineering. So that's what a lot of this class will will sort of give some examples of it. I'm not going to go too deep into it. And then the other thing that I have not looked at upon you this semester is like taking categorical data, like a yes, no, and changing that into a zero, one. So it's usually that's pretty straightforward, but sometimes it's not. All right. So <laughs> then I'm going to go off and like sort of like do some brainstorming with you, right? So like there's lots of work in data science, and if you can have someone else do it for you, I definitely recommend that. That's what this section will be about. All right. So if this isn't a machine learning class, but we're going to talk about supervised learning because that's where a lot of the work ends up being in machine learning. So I'm going to say there's the target. That's the thing that you're trying to accomplish, right? The, the outcome you're after. And the way that you get there is this other thing called features. So the way that you're familiar with this, these are the columns in your table, right? So every uh, variable is a column in your CSV. That's why that's another reason why pandas is pretty you know, use, useful is because that that data structure is uh, well suited for machine learning because it's pretty straightforward to convert that table that you have into a matrix, and the matrix is what gets operated on by your supervised learning algorithms. So we have variables as columns, and then if you remember, the rows are all observations. So this is like an event or a person or a record. Right? Those are all your observations. Okay, so to make that, I'm going to be a little bit more explicit. So you've got all the, the things that we were calling variables. Machine learning, it's going to take those and split those into like features. So these are all the, the things that we're training on, and then the labels. So this is like the outcomes that you're interested in. So that's, that's <laughs> I don't know whether I should like show this at the beginning of the class to say like this is why 601 matters, or show at the end of like this is why you learned what you learned. Either way. Okay, so this is just more words for you to like map in from what you're learning in 601 to understand how that relates back to machine learning. And then you're like, Ben, why do we have to learn all these new words? And the reason is because usually what people care about is for these for the things we have not seen yet, the, the new observations that haven't been reported to us, we want to make a prediction about what that category or class is going to be. Like, is this a picture of a hot dog or is it not a hot dog? Is it a picture of a cat? Is it not a cat? Right. So this is the the label column, and then these are all of the features that you're training on. So that's that's how we tie into the machine learning. Okay. So the hard, the tricky part is if you go back to this, like, well, someone just hands me this CSV and I'm done, right? Well, unfortunately, like that's not how it usually works out. So the 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 ability to describe which uh, outcome or which category or which label is applicable to a given observation is usually not part of your uh, reported data. Sometimes it is, and then your life is easy, but most of the time it's not. So this is the, the arduous process that most machine learning people will, claim, will complain about is the label, the, 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 the data is not labeled, therefore I have to label it. And then how do I do that? And that's a hard part. So I'm going to give you some tricks on how to do that. All right, so <laughs> quick overview is you could just start with a data set that has labels, right? That, that column of things you're looking for, if it's already present, you're done. Or you could manually label all the observations. If you have like 100 observations, then it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But then you realize 100 things that I'm training my machine learning algorithm on is not big enough. Right? I need lots of labeled data, like tens of thousands or a million records. And then I don't want to label a million things by hand, because that just takes a long time. OK, so then <laughs> standard trick is, have someone else do it for you. This takes either uh, the form of having the people who generated the data, have them do it for you, or pay someone else to do it. Like, that's how sad this process is, right? That those are your options. OK. So to break it down a little bit, um, <laughs> if you can find data that has, like, uh, that's cool. That's almost never the case in the real world, because if, if that were already done for you, then there wouldn't be a problem. You'd just have the problem solved. Like, so that's where I, again, like like I said, a lot of the upfront stuff is like getting the data, cleaning it, and then labeling it. This is 
where a lot of your time is. But so I'm, I'll claim you almost never start with label data, which again is misleading for Kaggle competitions, where they give you some label data and then say, like, go run this machine learning algorithm. All right. So obviously, <laughs> doing it by yourself is um, sometimes not practical, right? Like if you're trying to diagnose breast cancer from an X-ray like or a CT scan, like you need to have an expert, and an expert's time is very expensive, right? So like having a radiologist at $500 per hour tell you what this picture looks like, that doesn't scale very well for a million images. All right. <laughs> so then <laughs> there's uh, like, I don't know. If you've ever signed into a website and like tried to identify, does this picture have a street sign in it? Is there a car in this picture? Google has tricked you into labeling their data for them. Did you know that? Uh, yes, yes. That is your role in life, is to train Google's algorithms. <laughs> I apologize. So, so all those images that you're decoding when you sign into a website, like, like a street view, those are coming from street view, right? And Google wants to be able to label what is this object. And you're like, well, I could just tell Google the wrong thing. It's a result from search. Oop, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Google's listening in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so the so the, so you normally think if if Google is using me to label their data, then how do they know that I'm labeling it the right way? And the way that they do that is a voting method. Right? So, so they show the same images to like 10 people, and they're uh, you know, using you to, to look at this image, and then someone else looks at the same image, and then if you both agree that it's the right thing, then it's labeled correctly. So voting algorithm with crowdsourcing. So, right. Uh, yeah, and then like recaptcha, like street number signs and all that good stuff. OK. So <laughs> this obviously only works if you have a huge audience willing to do tedious work, which very rarely people have, right? Like the reason Google has it is because it's very popular, but you're not going to be very popular, so don't worry about it. All right. And I think the the last option that I have, which is, uh, it also takes work. So don't 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 think that this is like easy, right? So like figuring out how to appropriately take your unlabeled data transform it into a distributed task that you can hire people out to go do and then get reliable results from, that's not an easy job, right? So like I could give you a dollar to go label this picture a cat, right, or not a cat. But that wouldn't be very useful because you're likely to just give, you know, some label and then not get any, and not get the money back uh, of the charge for a dollar and then I won't know whether you actually labeled it correctly. So again, I have to farm that out multiple times to get a reliable label because the people labeling it don't have much incentive to do it correctly. So, so uh, has anyone participated in like Mechanical Turk? I kind of would be surprised. Okay. So Mechanical Turk is where you can you can sign up to do a task for like eight cents, and hopefully that task doesn't take very long, right? So if it's like labeling a picture of does this contain a dog, and they charge you eight cents, that's a reasonable thing because you can do many of those tasks per hour. So like maybe you could earn minimum wage by working really hard. <laughs> so that's mechanical turk. Uh, so, but again, it takes time to split that job into many small elements and then accurately pay people and get back useful results. So this isn't an easy route. It's a different route if you don't have this crowdsource uh, from all the people. Okay. So now I'm gonna let's see. Do I have time? Yeah, I think we'll take time. So we're gonna now that I've taught you basically everything in 601, we're gonna do an activity. I don't know that I have enough, so I'm just going to like throw these out, and you're going to have to find someone who has one. There. So you might have to over to someone who is not nearby you. So what we have is a set of steps. And so you might need to clear off some space because this takes a lot of space on your desk. So the challenge is <laughs> you have a sequence of steps. And when someone assigns you a new data science problem, 
you're going to have to figure out what to do, right? You now have been loaded up with all these different ideas of what you can do in data science. So I'm going to ask you to work with a partner and figure out what tasks should you do in what order. So please rank all of these slips of paper in, in prioritization. However many is available. I don't have a, an exact count. Replicated. So, so what happens if you start getting data, and then you go off and do some analysis, and you, and you realize I need to get more data? <laughs> but then, which one would you do first? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. This is like a. <laughs> <laughs> Are there two sets of. Uh, no. Okay. So you the might have. Might involve, yeah, yeah. Okay. Getting more data. Yeah, what do you have duplicates of? So if you get data once, then you do some analysis and you realize, oh shit, I need more data. <laughs> you make up a task. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm still trying to make sense of it. Because it's a demo. So, these are taking. 
Yeah, yeah. As a you're, you're the data scientist. Yeah. We have the authority to buy a software. Yeah. You're, you're often handed the credit card. Those are things that you have to make up. <laughs> like take take a break. Right. That could be a thing. Go do something else. <laughs> You guys got it all done? You guys got questions? All done? All right. We just want to know. Yeah. Then, you know, if we, we don't really do that, we we'll just clean our desk, please. <laughs> so, what do you need? Uh, so, I just wanted to know that so before we start analyzing or exploring the project, yeah. how we would go to the next like, we'll go to the next one. We'll go to the next one. You, usually not. Usually you go in blind. You have no idea what's going on. Okay. That's how a project usually starts. You might already be hired in a company, like doing stuff. So. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we have two different views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, so you're a new hire. Yeah, so okay. Thinking, like, and what was your role? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So what is our scenario here? You are working at a company. You're already employed. Yeah. Okay, let's take two more minutes and then we'll finish up. <laughs> Two more minutes. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so let's come back you can take a seat. <laughs> you can take a seat. If this, if this is really exciting for you, I'll give you a copy of the game. <laughs> All right, so I, I have a question. What did you have as your first thing to do? <laughs> Find a mentor. Yeah, All right. <laughs> Who's who had something else? Identify customers. Okay, that's nice. You guys will make great data scientists. All right. Anything else? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Okay, so my other question is, what did you have last? Okay, anything else? Anybody have anything different? Document your process, all right. That's what I did one time. <laughs> Integrate results. Wow. All right. That's pretty ambitious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so here's my first takeaway from this exercise. Everyone, well, it's highly unlikely that everyone had the same ordering of operations. You didn't even have the first same thing here or the last. Yeah, you had the same decks. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing I'll say is, if you ever have to work with a different data scientist who is not you, you will run into this problem, right? That you have some other opinion about how to do things. And I, <laughs> I haven't seen this in practice, but I would encourage, play this game with that other data scientist, right, before working on the project. Because if you're two smart people and you're trying to solve a problem and you don't agree about how to do it, it will cause some problems, some friction, right, among you as data scientists. So you'll have to navigate, you'll have to identify and then figure out how to resolve that disagreement. The other thing that I was saying, this is just an observation, I was playing the observer, is that some people had strong opinions. And that's totally fine, because as far as I can tell, there's not a really wrong way of doing this. Like, there's no wrong process. Um, some people came up with their experiences and said, when I was working on a project, I did this first, right? And that's a totally legitimate thing to do. The problem that causes is if someone else has a different experience and they have some other recommendation based on that experience, it's just hard to resolve who's right because you're both coming off of experience. And then the last thing that I also observed, so not just strong opinions, but it's sort of a dominant personality. If someone else is very quiet and you're working with someone who's quiet, it's easy to sort of like dominate that conversation because that person isn't going to speak up very much. So the last recommendation I have for this game is Make sure that you're trying to listen to the person you're working with about what their ideas are, because they may have some insights that you don't. So this is a tough one, especially if you're that one who speaks a lot. Try listening a little bit. OK. Anybody else have any other observations they want to add in? <laughs> no, there is no solution. <laughs> no solution. OK, I would like, if you, have, if you have the patience, to stack all these back up together in random order and then put the little clips on them and return them to the front. So I'll take those back. If you really want a copy of this game, because I do recommend it, I can give you the Word document that has all the little uh, pieces of, of text. <laughs> There's no solution. <laughs> I will share it in Blackboard. 
Huh? Oh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. There is no ideal order. That's. <laughs> yeah, but the. <laughs> so, but truly, so this is a game that I basically have to navigate. Every different project is going to be having a different approach because what's available at any given time is going to be different. So, like, if I want to work with the customer, but the customer is not available, I have to look back in my bag of things to do and say, which one of these can I do? So it's, there's both a prioritization and an availability. So the thing that I want to do next might not be the thing that I can do next. But it's very dynamic. There's, so I would even, so like, I would disagree with every one of these. I can tell you why this is a terrible outcome and why this is a terrible way to start. Like, <laughs> I don't think I could come up with the right solution. So every different project is, is different. All right. So let's take a break until 8.12, and then we'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Regarding the final presentation, yeah. uh, when are you going to give the final presentation today? No, the final presentations are in class on December 18th. Uh, you told that uh, today we can give the presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> if you're presenting, then you would go uh, at the end of class, so like about 9, 9 p.m. Sorry, okay. thank you. <laughs> Submit it along with them uh, with the presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you can present it. You can present it tonight and submit the notebook now. Is that what you mean? Uh, uh, can I submit it along with the other students or tonight yeah, yeah. Uh, because the documentation is not complete? Yours is still due on the 19th. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right.
the spare ones? Those are the ones where you make up the thing they do. Ah. Like whole thing on fire? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Standard stuff. Have you seen the last one? Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so we're so just to give you a heads up on the plan. So we're gonna do a little bit of lecture. So like the next hour or so will be lectureish, and then uh, the last uh, bit of time will be for final presentations. So two students will present. All right. So if you haven't seen this comic, XKCD is pretty reliably good. Uh, but this is basically how a lot of machine learning is done. People think that the algorithms are magic, and therefore they dump their data into the algorithm and then expect that the results are valid. That's and then, and if it doesn't work, you just keep trying until something works. And and this is no joke. So like, if this algorithm doesn't work in my data, try this one. And if that doesn't work, try this one, and try that one, right? And so literally, I I watch people in machine learning just try different algorithms. And if they don't work, then you move on to the next one. And that, as it, so I'm a physicist, and that is painful to me to watch because it means that the person doesn't actually know what they're doing. They're just trying things until something works. Once it works, they declare success, and they look brilliant. And it just kills me every time. It, it really does. It, yeah, OK. I'll, I'll not spend too much time. So that's the problem is like just, just because you have data doesn't mean that you're done. And it means that you have to have some knowledge of what's in the data in order to understand what should I do with the data. And so a few examples of that, um, often if you're working with time series data, you don't want to just throw all the time series data. Maybe there's something in the time series that matters more or is more important. But only you as a human initially know that about your data. And so you have to sort of like, work with the algorithms that you're using to say, this thing, I think, is probably going to be more relevant than these other things. But that's where your domain expertise as a human comes in um, when you're training a machine learning model. So for example, you may realize that you know if I'm looking at heartbeats, the distance between the beats matters more than just like the slope, right? Or maybe the slope matters. So picking out things to, to focus on is your role as a human. Yeah. All right. So then there's lots of, this is where it gets super messy. So there's lots of subjective choices to make that you don't know what the right thing to do is. And so you just get to do a bunch of them and see what works best. So an example of that is, again, if I'm looking at time series data, how much time is the right thing to try? So if you remember, we were looking at like electrical power data for Texas over the entire state for like five years worth of data at, was it five minute resolution? And so probably you don't want to spend all of your compute time looking at the data, if you could say, I just want to look at it on an hourly basis, because that's the thing, the resolution that's sufficient for my thing that I care about. right? Or maybe I care about a day level resolution. And if you can uh, make that choice, it's super important, because you're going to probably going to be paying for, or someone's going to be paying for the electricity to do all the computation on that data. And so if you can make a wise choice about how to uh, present that to your algorithm, you're going to be saving some money and time. Right. And then the other thing that a, a machine learning algorithm can't tell you is that if your data is literally insufficient to solve the problem, the machine learning algorithm won't solve it for you. Right. So like you may need a pro final project, right? you're combining multiple data sources to answer questions you couldn't otherwise on a single data source. So again, just having the data might not be sufficient. You have to get, combine that with multiple data sources to then have all the features and labels that you care about. That's really standard. All right, so let's say we've solved all those problems. <laughs> now we have more problems, right? So like, you have to take the text data or the categorical data you have and convert it into numbers. And uh, that's 
easy if you're starting with numbers, but then um, let's look at something else like categorical variables. So maybe I want to consider my uh, the counties of a state as categories, right, for some data, or maybe the, the, the states are themselves categorical that I'm using. So you could start out with something that is clearly not numerical and need to convert it into a category, some numerical representation. All right, and there's lots of sort of easy things. So like if I have uh, statements like a survey result, where there's like they give you the choice of like one to five, that's a very easy mapping. And the other thing that's important about that is the order map. So you have to figure out when I'm converting text data into numbers, does the order matter? And if it doesn't, then you have to do something else. So you, you, you just say one is better than two, and two is better than three. That order matters. But if you're looking at states or counties, there's no obvious ordering of counties or states. And so it would be a bad idea to say, you know, Delaware is number one, uh, Mississippi is number two, right? Uh, Maryland is number three. And so, like, ordering the states, that's a bad thing because then your machine learning algorithm is going to pick up on relations that aren't actually present in your data. So we need some other way than just assigning numbers isn't going to be sufficient. All right. So did, I don't know. Did we, was this covered in 602? Anyone who's in 602? No one? Yes. So was, you were in 602. Did they cover this concept? Yes. OK. Good. So then I won't, <laughs> I won't bother you too much. But <laughs> I hope so too. All right. Yeah. That, here's the question. As an instructor, you know how much communication there is with 602 instructors? Almost none. It's terrible. So I get to communicate through the students. <laughs> All right. So hopefully, if you're uh, in 602, sorry for boring you, but uh, so I'm going to cover what's called one, one hot encoding. So this is the idea of taking categorical data and converting it into a numerical representation without including order in the numbers. So we won't spend a lot of the time on this, but just to say it exists and it's the thing to do before you do the machine learning. All right, one, I didn't go there. All right, so if I have a list of strings that are different categories, the challenge is put that in a numerical representation. So there's this great thing called uh, scikit-learn. So scikit-learn has a thing that will convert it into numbers for you, and you just throw it at the, the label binarizer. It's fantastic. <laughs> and you're like, Ben, what the heck is a binarizer? So binary, that means a 0 or a 1. So basically, you're going to take your, uh, your string, and you're going to map it into one of these representations. So we're going to call 0, 0, 1 a number. That's like a number. And then 1, 0, 0 as a number. That's distinct from this one, but it's not clear that there is an order. So now the trick is you can tell your machine learning algorithm this is a number, but your machine learning algorithm won't try and figure out what is the relation between these numbers. So there's no clear ordering. So you're putting these in binary format that there's no order, which is the goal. All right. So yeah, I think that's if, <laughs> and this is like some very fancy work of like, if I have multiple data sets that I need, and I can map that, but we'll skip over that. So that's all present. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. All right. So one hot coding is the thing. All right. So now that we have some idea of like how to take text into uh, numerical data, now we're going to do the same thing for images. So again, you've hopefully seen this in 602. Yes, good. So this is, to me, the, the fun part of like, why is this hard? So 72 DPI, if you haven't heard of DPI, that's like the how many pixels there are. And it sort of tells you how grainy it is. And so if you have a 3 by 5 image, right, that's like this big, and you have a standard web format re resolution, there's 77,000 pixels. And so if I have some number of uh, colors in my picture, that means I have, have to represent it in combinations of red, green, and blue. And so therefore, there's uh, 59 million potential pictures that are this size at that resolution. So that's a lot of pictures. And you're like, well, that's cool. But I only have like 100 in my Facebook album, right? So the problem is, if you're trying to train a machine learning data set, uh, or a machine learning algorithm on this small data set of like 600 images, which to you might sound like a lot, but out of that huge pool of potential pictures, it's very small. So you're like, how, how would we possibly be able to learn anything about what is in the image from such a small sample size? And we're, we're, we're taking all these possible pictures, 
and I say I have 600 images, and I've now trained a machine learning model on that, that doesn't make any sense. And the reason for that is because the number of potential images is very high, but almost all of those are very random in appearance. Right? So the fact that you have like a cat in your picture has some edges, and all the other like, pictures are close enough to that non-random picture that, uh, that you can actually have some hope of that small sample actually working. So you actually don't care about most of the possible pictures. So that's why your machine learning algorithm works. But if we translate, so how does this tie back? So the reason this is relevant is because all those pixels, those are the numbers that you're going to have to represent to the machine learning algorithm. OK. So now let's, let's, what does that mean to change a picture into some values? All right, so I'm going to use a Python module called OpenCV for computer vision. So OpenCV is going to allow me to read in a picture and make it into a numerical representation by telling me what is the value of pixel. OK, so I'm going to have this PNG file, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, I load that in to the CV2, CV2 library, and then I get back. I'm going to store it into a variable called image. So that gets me back an image which is some number of pixels, 198 pixels by 254 pixels by 3. And again, where is the 3 coming from? That's your red, green, and blue pixels. So every different color that you get in your picture is composed of those three colors uh, per pixel. So some amount of red, some amount of green, some amount of blue gets me all the other colors I care about. OK, so now I can use matplotlib and say, given that numerical array, what does it look like? Well, it looks like that. <laughs> I think it's a Pokemon. <laughs> All right. So, so then you can say, well, what do what the numbers actually look like? And so if I look at the, in the image at core 0, 0, which is up in that upper left-hand corner, right? 0, 0 is up here. So pixel 0, 0 is 255 of red, 255 green, 255 blue. And you're like, these numbers don't make any sense to me. That's cool. There's an internet that can help you out. All right. So if you're wondering, like, what does what do these numbers mean, right? I can take all, every single triple of uh, numeric values and look up what that looks like here. So if I want to know, like, this color, what is that? Right. I can actually. There we go. So if I want to know, like, that number is 13, 20, 242, 250. This is how I translate back and forth between colors and numbers. Okay. So once we have some idea of like, there's three different layers. They're all independent array. Mm, I'm not familiar with saturation numbers. So like, I'm assuming that it's not it's out of the total number, right? Out of zero to two fifty six or zero to two fifty five. Two fifty five is the highest number. Yes. Oh. Yeah. That that is white. All right. So the total number of pixel, the total number of color values in this image, which is really small, it's 15, uh, 150,000 numerical values for this picture. So that's a lot. All right. So in the end, what we're going to want to do is take all those numerical values and cause them to be in one long vector, so that one long array. And that that is what's going to feed all the the machine learning algorithms that we'll use in supervised learning. So you're taking this, convert the numbers. OK. So <laughs> now the challenging part, and this is to me a little 601-ish, is that you have to take this image, and typically you want to make it smaller. And the trick is, this is a relatively small image, right? This isn't something that you take on your, your smartphone. It, it's actually pretty small. But um, remember that it's 150,000 numerical values. And so every one of those numerical values is going to run through your algorithm do some computation, take some time, and spend money and electricity. So those are resources you're going to have to pay for. So now, now there's an optimization game that you get to play. How small can I make the image and still recognize the image that I care about? So we basically have to find a way of making this the same representation but with fewer numbers. And so we're going to 
resample that image to a smaller size. So let's say I'm going to guess that I want it to be 64 by 64 pixels. So what does that look like? Wow, OK, that, that still is recognizable in some sense, but you can clearly see there's a loss of information. Right? And so, so then this gets to be a subjective question. Is this the image I still care about? You know, if I were a human, could I recognize this as the correct Pokemon character? Yes or no, right? Maybe the answer in this case is yes, in which case choosing a size 64 by 64 saves you time and money for compute. All right. <laughs> so this would be great if all of our machine learning were focused on one picture. But it's not, right? So we're going to have to do it in a lot of pictures. All right. So again, then you take that small image, and it's a smaller array. So the other game that we can play is that you can take your image, and instead of having three colors, just make it one color array. So this is called grayscale, even though it gets back to a not actually gray picture sometimes. So this is, I'm representing the same picture, but now I can hope that if color isn't important, then I can just compress all of those three uh, colors into one. So I don't know which color scale it's here, but this is my array of size, you know, same size as the original, but now with just one layer. So it's one color. All right. So I don't actually know what color scheme it picked out, which is why I think down here lower on, yeah. So I also can just like force it into actual grayscale. So this is, again, a question for you. Right. So when I read in the image, so here I was just reading in the same image, but I was passing it zero to say, like, compress everything to one color. And down here I said, I really do want it to be gray. All right. So this gets you a smaller image. And then, it, again, it becomes a question of, is this a sufficiently accurate representation of things I care about? If color is important to you, then you can't throw away color. But potentially, this is a great way of saving, you know, compute. OK, I think, I think that's all I wanted to show off of that, so blah, blah, blah. All right. There's other, so the rest of this notebook is a bunch of other libraries that basically do the same thing. So this is a super common task. So I think SK image and the other one is PIL. So other images, uh, say, sorry, same image with different libraries. OK, so that notebook is in. That notebook that I just showed you is on Blackboard, which is great because now there's an activity. <laughs> so the activity is I give you uh, many, many pictures. They're all of different sizes. And I want you to figure out what is the right size to resize all these images to. The smallest that still retains uh, an accurate representation of the picture, but allows you to uh, save time and money on the computer. I agree. So I'm gonna I'll sign you some random some random partners this time rather than leaving it up to your own devices. All right. Random partners. All right, you guys are all nervous, right? Who's gonna be working with today? All right. <laughs> I don't feel so bad. <laughs> Who's your partner? She's, like, yeah. uh, she's up in the corner. OK, so you need to find your partner. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, yeah, so, so in the board, the, the start, I have placed for you a, a starting notebook and the data set to work with. So I'll, I'll show you where those are in Blackboard under week 15. Uh, course materials, all the way at the bottom for uh, week 15. So let's see, there's images to analyze. That's one data set that you need. 
And then the other one is uh, Emphasizing Notebook. That's the notebook that you'll use to answer some questions. And then the, if you want to see what I was working on, that is located in this link of the week 15 notebooks. So I'm going to wander around. If you have questions, I'm, I'm here to teach, right? That's, I think, my job. And you will not be turning this in. This is not due, so <laughs> this is for your own enlightenment. <laughs> Maybe did you not get a partner? Huh? Oh. You can pair up with another group, so. <laughs> Who needs a volunteer? <laughs> All right. Okay. Is it good? Yes. All right. <laughs> street food's good, right? They need street food at UMBC. <laughs> Uh, so if you type uh, at the top your exclamation, yep, pip, install, cv2. See if that works out. Uh, well, uh, can I try a search here? You're running Anaconda, right? Mm, I'll wait for this. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Yeah. Well, I would I would recommend previewing the images so you have some idea of what data you're attacking.
Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah re restart and run all. <laughs> uh, the other thing that you can do, uh, I don't think. So, can I use your keyboard again? Yeah. All right. In Anaconda, do you have that? There we go. The Anaconda prompt is where you're supposed to run that command. So, I don't know if that's going to make a difference. Maybe. Let's see if this kernel. Uh, restart. It looks like it's making more progress there. Oh, there we go. Let's say yes. I well, I I don't use Anaconda, so I'm not in a good position to like say what normal looks like. That might take some time. Oh, yeah, the, the, the other thing I didn't think about. So if you look at the other notebooks that I lo loaded up for week 15, there's other libraries in there. So if those are easier to, 
to set up. So like PIL and SK Learn both have image processing capabilities. So yeah, or <laughs> that will delay you long enough to look at the other one. No, so if you look at the, oh, uh, sorry, image to feature vector, that's the one that I was looking at. You'll want to open that in, yeah. All right, and, and just out of curiosity, before I wonder how is this, how is that doing? Working away. How many things does it need? A lot. <laughs> okay, well, once that finishes, you'll have CB too, so. <laughs> Oh, wait. <laughs> okay, something went wrong. <laughs> if you're manually uploading images. <laughs> Would you like some help or are you gonna? Yeah. Something yes. Yep. Okay. Now you want this on the scatter plot? Yes. These are, these are multi dimensional, right? Well, so the dimensions of the image are going to be the first two values, right? So, like the third one will always be three. That one we don't care about. These two are multi dimensional, right? So, how do you plot multi dimensional scatter plot? So, like the, so if you had just those first two, so 4,000 and 6,000, you'd have a, a scatter plot. Right, with 4,000 and 6,000. Okay. And then the next pair of values, so 648 and 30, whatever that is, that'd be another point. So all of these are your x values and all those are your y values. Does that help out? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Yes. Um, those are noodles. This is, yeah, this is noodles. But how come our noodles got poisoned? Um, what? <laughs> loaded to. Um, I mean, even in the New York. What, what was your load command? The low command. So I am read. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. No, even in your notebook, yeah, uh, it is the same case, right? Sorry. Even you only because I, I, of the... after I flatten the image, like this is this is the original image. No, 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 that is, oh, it's no, not. This is not. not. <laughs> no, no, it's not. You can go to the original. Uh, been the yeah. original. Oh, is that's, it all? That's the your original. original one. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yours. Oh, I, uh, yes, also poison. <laughs> so every image is turned into this shit, I think. So. Oh, is it, I wonder. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. Is it only showing the blue, like the first layer? You know what I mean? I get like there's three layers. I wonder if it's only showing the first one. So, so how can I pick it up right now, though? Yeah. Uh, well, if we go down, so, well, did you already get all the sizes? I just got it. So this this is a separate thing. So if you go back to the the previous section, so the goal was what is the size of all the images? All right. So if you scroll up a little bit more. How did you? Oh, somewhere in there. Let's go on. Okay. So visualization of image sizes. All we're after here in this this section. So I didn't realize where you were. The visualization of image sizes is just a scatter plot. So. The resizing and the coloring, we're not there yet. Oh. So okay. this section is on just get me a coordinate of how big it is. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and plot is going to plot that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Of all of the sizes. Okay. So I will come back and try to answer that question. These sizes of 128. Well, this, right, this is the fun part. So you have to look through and figure out. But you try Huh? Hit and trial method. Well, so so that's the thing. If you have like a thousand images, is it reasonable to look through all of them? Probably not, right? So just looking through like a few of them and saying like, is this sufficient? And so that's to me the challenge is like, like I would try like small, like 64 by 64, and then you know, 128, 256. So yeah, we tried 128 by 128. Yeah. So this is I don't have a right answer for this. So like it depends on the user. Well more of the machine learning algorithm that you're after, but yeah. So you guys, this this is the goal of like, you know, how small can I make my image, but still see the things that I care about? Yeah, this is what I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it th and like the, the challenge is having a good sampling of your pictures because if you have a lot of pictures, so like some are of text, some are of people, some are of landscape, some are of other things, right? So like if you have a lot of diversity, then the smallest feature that you're trying to see in the image, you might accidentally like make it too small and you'll lose that. Okay, so it depends on what, what are we... What are you... Exactly, what exactly. So like, you know, the question of is there a person in this picture depends on like, is it like a portrait or is it like their whole body or a group of people? Like, you know, it gets very messy, I think. So, but yeah, so you guys, and what was your scatter plot look like? Uh, we, we, we never <laughs> opened that. <laughs> okay, the first section is on like, just seeing the distribution of sizes. So this is also a challenge of like, these people are wearing helmets. Right? Yes. Yeah. If we are uh, trying to find only helmets, yeah. So uh, the size of the picture depends on uh, how clear it, yeah. clearly the helmet is displayed. Right. Okay. Let's take three more minutes, and then we'll finish up.
Okay, so let's come back to our desk. If you haven't finished, that's perfectly cool. You can work on this after class on your own. All right, so while you're, while you're moving around, I'll give you a quick walkthrough of how I did it. Okay, so <laughs> once, once I have the images downloaded, I'm going to use glob to get a list of all the images. That's my list of files. So I grab both PNGs and JPEGs. So a separate thing that I didn't talk about is file image formats. So you can get files in like TIFF, which is TIFF. You can get raw files. You can get JPEGs. You can get PNGs. There's lots of different image formats. And so another thing would be to format all of your images in the same uh, sort of file format to make your image processing more consistent. OK. So then uh, what did I do? So all I did was I just read the, the shape into a list of x and y values using the shape off the image, and then plotted that as a scatter plot. So this is what I think you should have gotten. This is everybody's consistent on that, right? Yeah? OK. <laughs> so then the extra step would be like a histogram of like what are my most popular shape sizes, right? And like, so where this is going is if you have gigantic pictures, panoramas, panoramas are going to like show up way over here or way up there, right? Like, so. <laughs> The, the fun thing is, like, if you're looking at clip art, clip art's all the same size, right? Or you're looking at images from smartphones or uh, SLRs, right, single lens reflex, or panoramas, like, that would show up, hopefully, in this, this scatter plot. That'll hopefully give you some idea of what your sort of compression aspect should be, right? Often, 
for training data, you'll often see exercises where they're starting with like square pictures just for convenience. But if that's not where you're starting out with most of your data set, that's a good thing to know. Okay. All right. And then my shape. So all I did was I uh, looked at each file. I figured out what the extension was so that I could remove it. And I removed the extension and then placed it in. The reason I did the file name was to grab it into a different folder. So basically, I'm taking the file name and I'm renaming it so that I know what size I changed it to offline. And then I'm just grabbing the resize function there. All right, so if I run all this, this takes a little bit of time. So, and you're like, we only have 20 pictures, right? What could this be? So, <laughs> I mean, we're processing something like 120 gigab 20, uh, megabytes of data, right? So this is a, a pretty standard computational problem is like you're given all this image data and you're going to have to resize it. And so you're usually going to try and find a small sample of data where you can test out the scaling of your, your data before you do it on all of your data because it's going to take a long time. OK, so I just tried out 64, 128, 256. And then I put those into little directories. And then I also looked at the size after I made it into grayscale. So all of that's there. on. Obviously, you can put this in a for loop. So that's it. It takes a while to run. So I think something like a minute or two. Yes, shoot. Yes. How long will we have access to the course material on Blackboard? This, I ask because this seems like the kind of course where, like, at later points in our career, we will want to come back and pull for stuff we've learned yeah. from that, this course. Okay. <laughs> has anyone else had that? Has anyone else had that question? Awesome. All right. Man, have I got the answer for you guys? All right. <laughs> All right. OER Commons. Right. So, I, as you may have noticed, I'm an open source proponent. I don't want you to pay for any software ever. I also wouldn't want you to pay for any course materials ever, right? So I wouldn't want you to buy a book. I don't want you to have to do any of that stuff. So it turns out that all of my course, this is, I love your question, by the way. So, so I'm very excited. And now I get to rant on my passion topic. So all of my course material is open source and free on the internet. So you may have already found the YouTube videos. So all the recorded screencasts or YouTube videos, those are Creative Commons. means you can mix them to your heart's concern. The, the course materials, though, are also on this website called most.oercommons.org, blah, blah, blah. So I can share that link out. But basically, this is where a link to all of the course materials are posted. So they're not, so that's the, I forget. I think they're in box. I forget where oh, they are. Uh, I did a quick answer to where they are actually hosted. I can tell you that, though. Oh, yeah. So they, they are actually loaded. Uh, they're actually uploaded to the site. So they are not linked to um, the like the box or UMBC Blackboard or anything like that. So they're off. They're, they're supposed to be accessible to everyone on the internet. So you're paying here not for the course materials, but to see my pretty face. So, <laughs> All right. so this is from the previous semester. <laughs> this is from the previous semester. So this semester's content will go up sometime in late December. So all of the course materials and notebooks that are from this semester will be up on this website again. So I'll send that out. Are we only exposed to the Blackboard <laughs> You can if you want. <laughs> this will be a more efficient method. <laughs> this is more the fancy way. Right, right. <laughs> WGIT. <laughs> so the reason I, so not just out of the kindness of my heart, but I got a grant for $1,000 to do this. So that's why. Uh, the University of Maryland. So, Univers so University of Maryland wants all of their students to not have to pay for textbooks or course materials. So they're trying to motivate all of the instructors at UMBC to do this. So I'm the example that they use. Ben can do it. Why can't you? <laughs> if that ever works out. So if you have, so I, this is a role for you. So you can apply pressure to your instructors and say. Other instructors at UMBC are posting their content for free and open source on a, on a site not linked to Blackboard or UMBC. Can you do that for this course? Right? That's the type of pressure that you can apply as a student. Right? So you can say, like, other teachers are doing this. Can you do that? Most teachers are very reluctant because they've never done that before. 
All right. So I'll take a little bit more of your time before the final project presentations to do uh, audio. So I like audio because it's different, but the same. All right. So has anyone here used Pandora? It's like an old school thing, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. So, so before Spotify, <laughs> right? <laughs> before Spotify, there was Pandora. So back in the day, right? <laughs> so, so this is a crazy idea. So in California, they hired musicologists. Basically, these are people with PhDs in music theory, and they hired these PhDs in music theory to listen to songs all day, every day. And, and, and so, That's their job? yes, that is their paid job. Yes. Yeah, it takes a PhD to do this musicology. So, so what they produced was called the Music Genome Project. And so you had these PhDs listening to songs. And then for every single song, they had something like 400 different ways they could rank that song. So is there any spoken voice? Is there a guitar? Right? Uh, is this a fast-paced song? Right? What is the beats per minute? Yeah. So all of these different features about this song snippet. Well, why would you pay a bunch of PhDs to do that for many years? Because you think you could make money off of it, right? <laughs> so the money-making part is, if you can figure out all these different features of every different song, then you can say this song is like this song. So therefore, if you're listening to this song, you might also like this one because it's in the same genre, right? But maybe it's because this country song is like this rock song, so they might not actually be in the same category, but they share a lot of features. So if you like this one, you might like that one. And I don't know if they ever did that. <laughs> so anyways, this is all uh, tra trademarked and patented and all that other good stuff. But the idea was pretty clear. You pay a bunch of experts to listen to a bunch of music. Um, and so that you can read about this in detail. but. This seems like a lot of work, uh, so I'm glad I didn't have to do that. All right, back to, right. So that's how they founded their business, is on machine learning, basically, and, and recommendation. So so we're going to do a, a slightly different other use case that I would say uh, is pretty prominent, is like, when I said the word Google, my phone heard me, and then recognized that that was the word Google. <laughs> so the way that it's doing that is it's, audio processing all the signals that come in and looking for the word Google in that. Uh, that's pretty magical, so how would they do that? Yes. <laughs> all right. All right, so I'm going to use a library called Libroso, right? I, I, I definitely don't want to write this library because it would be a nightmare. So I'm gonna, it's a long install process. But basically, the cool thing is you can take a WAV file. So a WAV is an audio format. And then, I don't know. <laughs> so this is one minute of classical violin. It's very exciting, so I'm not going to play all of it. OK, so the, the fun part is this is how long the music is in terms of like the little segments of, of uh, time that we're sampling it, and we're giving it a certain number of samples per second. So this is the sampling rate. So I can load this data in, and I can chunk it into little pieces of uh, data. Right? That's that's basically what uh, we're doing with Librosa. So we're taking the audio and we're converting it into a, a, a numeric file with a sampling rate. So we're like, well, that's a lot of work. I didn't have to do that. So what would we do that? Well, this may be a visualization that you've seen before. So this is the amplitude of that sound, right? So this is like, if you're to play this, this is the volume, basically. And you're like, well, that's cool. <laughs> um, so if you zoom in, sort of like it's it's this big blob, right? So it's like basically the amplitude of the wave is changing, and that's like the volume. So it's just zooming in. And you're like, Ben, that wouldn't make very much value to sort of like do any machine learning, just looking at the volume. So we're gonna have to think a little bit harder about how to do that. So again, this is, again, just another picture of the amplitude. There's not a lot there to, to learn on, and so that's not how we do things. Okay, so <laughs> there is uh, there are additional features. And so this is what's called the Fourier transform. And 
hopefully uh, you recall many lectures ago, there was a lecture on that involved the Fourier transform. If you don't remember, that's totally cool. It was pretty short. So the idea is there's the, the sound waves have a volume, that's the amplitude, but they also have a frequency. So the sort of pitch that the sound is at. And the, the way that you hear this sound is by composing many different pitches or frequencies at the same time. So that's my voice is actually a composition of a bunch of different frequencies coming out. And so on this axis, we have the frequency of the sound in hertz. And then this is time. And this is how much of each of those frequencies there are. So this is the, we're, we're getting that information about the frequency decomposition from the Fourier transform on the original input signal that we had. Right, we started out with this one dimension, so x up here. When I when I load in the data, I get back this really long. How long is that? 1.1 million data points. And basically, I'm doing little Fourier transforms on sections of that to get back this. So basically, when you look at the amplitude, that's each of these frequencies has some amount of contribution to the overall sound signal. And so if I sum all those up, that's the amplitude across all the frequencies. Right? That's my volume. OK, questions so far? Hopefully, I haven't lost anybody. So <laughs> this should look. Um, like a good thing because we just did uh, some analysis of images, right? <laughs> and this is a two-dimensional image. <laughs> oh, man. Right. So, so uh, the the pro so the problem is we're not done, right? So like the, the Fourier transform is just like to get you the first step. And I'm not an audio engineering expert, so I'm not going to take you down this path. All I'm going to show you is some pretty pictures, which basically indicate. There's lots of different ways that you can take this Fourier transform data and then apply different decompositions to get different features from your, your music. So <laughs> I can't tell you about all these things, but they're just different representations of the same data with different audio transformations applied. So whether or not they're important depends on what you're trying to learn and how much processing you can sort of withstand. OK, so I think that's all I got for audio processing. Basically, turn it into pictures, and decompose those pictures into other pictures that you can then do machine learning on. Magic. <laughs> all right. That was all I have on that. And I think final presentation time. Perfect. All right, so we have two people. Does anyone want to go first? <laughs> all right, we have a contestant. <laughs> 